Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the certified freak seven days a week of King and Ashura. We are talking about the Oma sexual, Oma's number one fan, the sole solitary member of the cult of Oma, the man who tried to groom his own Oma, the man who tried to grow his own Oma, the man who tried to surpass our main character, Oma. And also the man who has a very big problem when it comes to, well, his sexual activities. Kiryu Setsuna. Now, I know what you're all thinking. Sink, why do you look like this? Where's the videos? Where's the clips? Uh, you see, what had happened was, with that being said, let's go ahead and talk about the beautiful beast himself, Kiryu Setsuna. Now, as a bit of a disclaimer, we're going to talk about a little a couple hot topics when it comes to Kiryu. So yeah, Kiryu has done a lot, man. Let me check the list. We got prostitution. We got patricide. We also have, well, he was actually born just to be in organ donor. So there's a lot of things involving Kiryu here, and we got a lot of notes to go through here, okay? And so with that, what we're going to cover today is Kiryu's entire role in the story, how he fits, what he did, what he does, why he is the way that he is, why he loves Oma to the point of having a boner just by having his name mentioned. Because, you know, he went through that whole prostitution thing. Then he was, you know, hit with the promised Neverland from his dad. A lot of things are questionable when it comes to Kiryu. But what we can never take away from him is that he is actually a very upstanding gentleman behind all the layers of him. You see, with Kiryu, he's actually a really nice guy when you think about it. Because the way that he talks to Shion, the way he talks to Matsuda, when he even tried to pull out pause of Kazi, Shion, Matsuda to escape what was supposed to be Nico, quote unquote, attacking. Now, when it comes to Kiryu, I initially always did think he was just like a crazy person, but when you actually look into the crevices and the details of his character, he is really, I almost want to say tragic, but at the same time, he is still crazy, okay? I'm not going to take away the fact that Kiryu is a crazy-ass person, but what led to him being as crazy as he is kind of makes sense. So sit down, buckle up, strap in, let's go ahead and dive deep into Kiryu's character. So when it comes to Kiryu's character design, he was originally designed to be a stalker already. You see, Sandro wanted Kiryu to be this creepy stalker yandere pervert, but he didn't expect people to latch on to him the way that he did. The only reason he really became so pervy is because they roasted him in the comment section for that manga, okay? <laughs> They roasted him in the comment section for the first few chapters in the manga. And when they said, yo, man, this dude cured you. looks like absolute garbage. He looks like nothing. He doesn't look at all that impressing as opposed to the God that is Ozu. Okay. Do not forget about our God Ozu. The one who taught Hibiki and the others in Danburu how to do all those body weighted exercises that you can do at home. You know, the, the dips, the squats, all that simple stuff you can do at home. And this man, Ozu, pioneered it in the series, okay? Don't ever take that away from him. This man is an absolute legend. He is the barbarian. Sorry, he's the intelligent barbarian for a reason. And a crazier thing when it comes to Setsuna is that they originally wanted him to be introduced after the Sekibayashi fight, where they wanted him to be introduced after the Sekibayashi fight, where the medicine man fight happens, then Sekibayashi then Setsuna shows up and starts to fight Oma. But they say, bro, this is looking a little bit too one-dimensional, Sanjo. Let's try to add in some new characters in between the Medicine Man and Sekibayashi. Try to broaden the horizons of the world a bit. And it worked out really well because we got really a nice little eye-opener right there between different fighters existing in the series. Anyways, back to Kiryu. So the surname Kiryu actually translates to Palawina, where Kiri and living with you. Now, I also learned that Palawina is actually a tree that is indigenous to East Asia, mainly in China, and all their leaves are shaped like hearts, which is a nice touch considering Setsuna's loving nature of everyone else. Speaking of his first name, um, Setsuna translates to instant or moment. So you could say that Setsuna is living in the moment where his heart is as big as a tree. I am not going to take that one back. Like I said before, Cessna really just loves a lot of people. It's just that he really loves Oma. That's the only thing. If it ain't Oma, he don't want it. But if you're just like a chill person, just like a bystander, Shion, um, Kazi, you're cool. 
He's not going to hurt people for no reason. The only reason he went crazy was because he saw those Nikos. That's the only reason he went crazy. Outside of that, Setsuna, nah, he big chilling. As to why Setsuna is built like the beautiful twink that he is, he is actually made to be in contrast to Oma, which a lot of the characters are. Anyways, on to the backstory. So, Kiryu's backstory actually begins all the way in, in the inside. It's just like Squidward, man. It all started on the day I was born where Kitty was actually born to be in, I believe the proper turn is an organ harvest. So he was essentially like the kids in Promised Neverland. Yeah, I ain't gonna lie, bro. This man's father was a little cuckoo, if you would. A little cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, if you would. But he, the inside, as we already know, is a crazy place. It is, if you don't know what the inside is, by the way, the inside is like this lawless land inside of Japan. It's like the outskirts of the city where anything goes there. So Kiryu only reason for being born was to just be organs for his father, to, for his father to harvest and then sell off on a black market. Well, I guess in the inside, it's just a market at that point plant that Kiryu was on. Oma actually thought that they were moving in on his turf. So he slid on them and killed every single one of them. He killed every single person in that building because he believed they were on his turf. There was no other reason for Oma to go over there into Kiryu's life outside of them being two steps too close to where Oma's territory was. I ain't gonna lie, bro. At that point, he is a god. So I don't blame Kiryu for, you know, believing in Oma being a god at that point. Because think about it, if an eight-year-old showed up and was just murking these grown-ass men left and right like they were nothing, and then he had the like, well, that that face he had was actually not at all that that adorable. So um yeah put it simply Kiryu has a very weird sense of what he believes god actually is okay to Kiryu, he believes that oma coming in saving him for what would have been his death makes oma god but in his sense as well he wanted oma to kill him where he wanted oma to i guess free him from life which is a really weird sense. But when you think about this for a second, okay, hang tight for me, okay? I'm, I'm not going to make sense, but I'm going to make sense in a second. Oma had killed Kiryu's captors before he could be harvested because he thought they were moving in on this turf. And from then on, Kiryu saw Oma as a god that would then destroy him in order to free him from this horrible world. And then Oma ran off. So, of course, what would any person do if they believe that they just witnessed God? You're going to want to go find him. And so, being unable to find Oma at that point, Kiryu then said, okay then, I gotta start building up my connections so I can find God again. And so, what did he do? The same thing that anyone wanna do if you wanna build a connections, you gotta sell. On what sells? Sex. Sex sells. Kiryu knew this at a young age, so unfortunately he did this at a young age. I won't say exactly what happened here, but you know what happened here if you read the anime. Anyways. This is where Kiryu then started building his connection with the Goyu Ward in order to track down his father, you know, the kingpin at this point. He's out here selling organs and shit. So he does this, and then after managing to find his dad, he murks him. So hold on, let's put this into perspective, okay? This man Kiryu just went on a full anime revenge story. His dad, who had initially only made him be born just so he can become an organ plant then he is saved by this magical person this fairy like creature then shows up out of nowhere then saves him kiryu then believes oh nah nah i can finally get the get back he goes and get revenge kills his dad and now he's on the quest in order to thank god that's his story so if we put ourselves in the mind of kiryu at this point we now believe that oma is god oma is the way oma is the one so now that we believe that that Oma is God, let's now, oh, look at that. We just witnessed God getting beat up by some homeless Joe across the street. Who is this guy out here beating up on my God? Who is this homeless Joe? Tokita Nico, the cool Nico. This is when Kiryu starts meeting the cool Nico. And as he meets the cool Nico, he witnesses the cool Nico starts training Oma, where he's like beating him up and everything. And this anger sets in a think about it how mad would you be if you witnessed your guy getting beat up by some homeless joe that you don't even know because think about it the cool nico doesn't even have a name he stole it he borrowed it that's not even his name 
So from this point on, that's when Tokita Nico in Kiryu's eyes is now the devil. Or rather, the cool Nico is the devil because at the moment he met the cool Nico, that's when the uncool Nico then showed up and said, yo, come on, man, let me teach you that Nico style real quick. I'm gonna show you how to beat up that little devil over there, okay, young buck? And so they then pick up how, so then Kiryu picks up how to use the Nico style and then they go back and start attacking Tokita Nico. I'm sorry, the cool Nico. Yo, man, I got this one guy you gotta go learn from. His name is Genzon. Bro, pick up that Koei style. That shit is fire. And so Kiryu did that. He went down, saw Genzon and said, yo, old man, let me go learn that Koei style. Then Genzon said, I got you, bro. Then he teaches Gen, then Genzon teaches Kiryu how to use the Koei style. And then they go back and start attacking Tokita Nico. I'm sorry, the cool Nico. So as, they, as they're attacking the cool Nico, that's when the cool Nico is like, dang, man, I'm injured. Oh, it hurts. Oh, it hurts. That's when um, Genzon then shows up and has a match with Tokita Nico, the cool Nico, and Genzon kills Nico. Now, Here's the important detail. The only reason that Genzon, well, not the only reason, but Genzon did kill a wounded Nico as to why they actually fought, I don't know. It's never really explained. If you do know, comment it down below, because I'm curious. Anyways, after Kiryu and the uncool Nico squabble with the cooler Nico, and after the cooler Nico has been killed off by Genzon, almost thinking to himself like bro nah i gotta get Genzon back i ain't gonna be here i'm gonna hunt him down and i'm gonna kick his ass now mind you we're still in his backstory okay this man kid you went through like death matches and all weapons were allowed in this instance so these aren't just fisticuffs that he's going through he's going against people who's out here using knives weapons I want to say guns. So after he finished killing off all the noteworthy fighters in those underground death matches, he then, well, killed Genzon. And here's the thing, okay? It's a little bit tricky for me to process this, but Nico fought the uncool Nico and Setsuma. Then the cool Nico fought Genzon. Then Genzon killed the cool Nico. Now, Setsuna kills Genzon, and by doing so, he took Oma's goal. And the thing is, Setsuna only did that because he knew that Oma wanted to kill Genzon. There are so many reasons that bother me about this, but he knew that Oma wanted to kill Genzon because it would cause the anger that is targeted towards Genzon towards Setsuna. So it's all a ploy to gain Oma's attention, and he does so. Unfortunately, it isn't the way that he initially had planned when they had their encounter at the beginning of the story, And but Kiryu took it and ran with it. You saw the boner. That is a lot of a backstory. At least in Setsuna's eyes, that's how he wants it to go. But of course, we all know that Setsuna is a crazy person, so let's go ahead and talk about his personality. So when it comes to Kiryu's personality, he loves four things. Oma. Shion and Masura, Oma, cats. And I guess five things because Oma, of course. And during Asura, he is a complete yandere stalker for Oma. He loves him so much that he'll kill anyone who loves him. But despite this obvious obsession, it's weirdly calm and tame and respecting whenever he's talking with another person. You see, it's like I mentioned earlier, if you take away everything Oma related from Setsuna or Nico related from Setsuna, he is a really good person. Like, he had the money, so he's just walking around the girls' academy, just big chilling. He's not out here walking around like a creep or anything. This man's like sitting by the water fountain saying, hey, how's it going? Are you going to class? Good job, girls. You know what? Go get that education. He's just being a really good person. He's very cordial. He's very formal. He's very nice whenever he talks. Even when he's like going into that whole fallen demon or losing his mind and everything, he's talking in a very calm, sincere, and formal manner because that's just the way that he is. The only reason he's acting so crazy is because on the inside, he's still like not right in the head, but he's right as a person. And I feel like that's the running thing when it comes to Setsuna. He's just not right in the head, even though everything else about him is actually correct. He's probably the one of the nicer people in the series if he just wasn't so crazy. He doesn't actually change that much in Omega, except he actually finds a bit more of a tame 
standing for himself. When I say tame, I mean he's not all orgasming when he sees Oma or talks about Oma anymore because now he went from admiring Oma and wanting him to end him so much to now wanting Oma to praise him. He wants Oma's attention and he understands that now. He doesn't have to have Oma show up in order to kill him. No, he is looking now to surpass Oma. He wants to surpass his god so that his god would then become stronger and then annihilate him and that's actually might be his main goal at least that's what i got from his fight with the tiger nico i'm sorry the uncool nico anyways on to his fighting style so as i mentioned earlier he is a martial arts prodigy normally it would take a person about eight years in order to learn rakusha's palm for the kole style but setsuna only mastered it in just one year so he is already big ball and he's really, really smart. He's like Cosmo level tier when it comes to being a genius. But the Koei style as a whole, it has two techniques that are named Blink and Rakish's Palm. Blink is a technique where you're moving into the person's blind spot when they're blinking. So you're basically just moving as the person is closing their eyes in order to get into their blind spot. Whereas Rakish's Palm is set to a signature move. This is where he just turns his wrists to the point where it actually causes everything, like the point of impact, to actually start twisting with it. Now, Setsuna is able to do Rakish's Palm in many different ways, and he's able to use Blink in many different ways. Most notably is going to be when he uses Blink in order to try to get into Kuroki's blind spot. He uses Blink to get into Ren's blind spot. Then he uses Blink not just once, but he evolves it in Omega, where he uses it twice. That's right. So he goes to the person's blind spot one time, then goes to their blind spot a second time. And that's how he was able to get the jump on the uncool Nico when they fought. We'll get more into that later. But when it comes to blink, it's actually a pretty solid move. It's just basic footwork, really. So Setsuna's second move, of course, is going to be Rakish's palm. This is what he's most known for. During this move, he is taking his arm and twisting it with more force than Genzon ever did when he performed the Koei style. That's an important detail because Setsuna leveled up Rakish's palm to make it even more deadly according to Kuroki where with Genzon he would use it in order to cause like a little bit of pain where Kiryu is actually doing it so much of a rotation that it increases the lethality of the move now I'm not a master of the Koei style I know nothing about fighting so don't even ask me about that but this is exactly what we gotten from the story so bear with me all right so with Rakish's palm it is very very weird because it involves a lot of rotation and I know that the wrist is able to rotate, your foot is able to rotate and that's how he's able to do what's called Rakish's soul where he does the exact same twisting motion only with his foot. He does this against Kuroki where he impacts the entire ground. Twist the fucking ground by the way. I'm sorry this man just caused earthquake in my fighting anime? Anyways, yes he then twist it into the ground causing a little bit of dent making Kuroki lose his balance but he also used it as like a full-on attack against Kuroki and he uses it as a full-on attack against the Tiger Nico. Then we have the third version which is true Rakish's palm. Now this one I'm very skeptical of because we only saw it once and it was during when um, Kiryu had activated Fallen Demon which we'll talk about later but true Rakish's palm is where he takes his hands it's like a little bit of a like a nail almost and he actually twists his fingers with it, which is really weird. I kind of get it, but I kind of don't because it's supposed to be like a true pinpoint attack where Rockers Palm is a little bit of a wider range for turning your wrist, where true Rockers Palm, I think you're turning both your wrist and your fingers. It's all hypothetical. It's never really written clearly on what it actually entails, but I am curious on this. If you guys got any more detail on that one, please comment down below. I want to know a little bit more about true Rakish's palm. Thank you. Now on to the Nico style. Now Setsuna uses the Nico style. He only uses really like five or four moves or so. So he uses the Weeping Willow, Flash Fire, Swimming Swallow, and Fallen Demon. The one he most notably is known for is using Fallen Demon as during this move, all of his senses are heightened and he can move and dodge a lot easier. But the problem with Kiryu using Fallen Demon is that after he uses it, he just goes batshit crazy, okay? This man starts seeing visions of the cool Nico and he says, nah, I hate this guy. I wanna kill him. I gotta get him out of here. And he thinks everyone around him is Nico. So when he was going around the entire stadium just murking people left and right, he was thinking they were Nico. So to him, he was just exterminating Nico, but he was actually exterminating this random people for no reason. Now, what makes the Koei and the Nico style so cool is that 
he combines these into a move that's called mingling of the fox and tiger now it's a mixture of the koei style rockets of palm the nico style swimming swallow where he's actually able to like move around do like a double team from pokemon and such and then attack at just random intervals he uses this move on kuroki now another one that he mixes with is going to be the gao style i really hope i said that name correctly because I have never heard anyone say Gao Ryuki, Gao Mukaku, or anything like that. So I really hope I said that right. But he learned a little bit of the Gao style from watching Ryuki fight, and that's when he started using the Earth Dragon and Rakusha Soul in order to create the Gao style X Koei style air rending. But with that covered, let's get ready to rumble with the fights. So, first up, we have his match with Ren. Now, this one was a match between the two pretty boys of the series. Each one capable of pulling half the stadium if they wanted to, both men and women, mind you. Now, I'm not going to hold you, bro. Ren actually has a secret baddie that no one knows about, and I'm not going to do y'all the justice of saying the name out loud. Anyways, let's go on to the actual fight. So, at the start of the match, this man, Cutie, was out here spamming Blink in order to trip up Ren like his Naruto Clash of Ninjas. And, you know, when people started spamming that substitution Juzu, I hate that fucking log, man. Anyways, when Ren got off his Keylong, Setsuno broke out of his Genjutsu and fired off back with a Rakusha's Palm, twisting Ren's inside and reminding Ren that this isn't an assassination. This is an extermination. His extermination. He is the victim. He is the one who should be running away. But Ren tried to, you know, make one of those last stand. He got off that one attack, and it looked pretty good. I ain't gonna lie. He did a little bit of damage there. Two claps for that one, Ren. Anyways, that's when, you know, enough toying with him, where Setsuno then creeped up behind him like it was Freaky Fridays, tapped him on the cheek like he was playing Donkey Kong Jungle Beat, twisting his heart and advancing on to the next round. Now, it is important to note that I initially did believe that Ren died, but Ren managed to survive. How he actually survived after having his heart twisted, I don't know. Unlike watching Oma's match with Inaba where Setsuna then creamed himself, watching his match with Ryan kind of just sat unhealthy with Setsuna, and that's because Oma still, as he put, clung to the Nico style. What Setsuna wants from Oma is him to absolutely use his raw power and just kill and dominate whoever he is against because he is a god that's what he should do he shouldn't really be clinging to the tactics of the quote-unquote devil i hate that i have to say this in order for it to make sense for a setsuna video anyways before his match with kuroki kuroki was out here talking to him like bro so you're the one that beat up my best friend you're the one that killed my boy and this man Setsuna's looking at him just like, bro, who are you, old man? I ain't got time for you. Go home. In fact, I'm going to make you go back home to where you belong. I'm sorry. I got to say it like Setsuna. Hold on. <clears throat> Excuse me, sir. If you would please disperse yourself before I disperse you. Please. Thank you kindly. Now, this man, Setsuna, is always talking like some kind of a psychopath. Like, if you guys watch, um, what was it, Base Motel, this man is talking like Norman the entire time. He is so calm and collected, but he is out for blood all the same, and Kuroki could sense it immediately. So, during their match, Kuroki then got an idea that, okay, nah, this dude is not one to mess with. This is different from Genzon. Even though he already knew the Koei style, Kuroki knew that Blink wasn't going to work on him, but Setsuna still tried it. It wasn't until Setsuna managed to get off one Rakusha's palm that Kuroki then said, Woo! This guy a little different. Nah, this man, nah, he more deadly than Genzon. I ain't messing with this, bro. I'm sorry, big bro, but you got the wrong student on this one. And so that's when Kuroki started taking Setsuna a little bit seriously, okay? Now, out of all the characters in this series, Kuroki is the only one who's actually seen the Koei style to his full potential prior to the Annihilation Tournament. And on top of that, him being best friends with Genzon meant that Setsuna's life was already on a timer because this is Kuroki we're talking about here. Kuroki! And so... When he tried to use Blink, he couldn't reach Kuroki. When he tried to use Rakusha's Palm, that couldn't reach Kuroki. He tried squeaking out some Nico styles that kind of got him the edge for a little bit. But that nipped Kuroki a little bit. I kind of give him that one, okay? That, that, that swallow, that swimming swallow was actually pretty good. The entire match as a whole was beautifully written out because it showed that Cessna is really, really freaking powerful, but Kuroki is just able to read him like it was a Dr. Seuss book. And so, 
it was not really a fair fight with Setsuna's case because he was against someone who knew all of his moves inside and out. And so the match ended with Setsuna getting the Devil's Lance piercing right through his heart. And that's when the aftermath kicked in. And this is really odd to me because we all were supposed to believe that Setsuna would have died and that kind of would have been a fitting end for him, but it's not a fitting end for the story. So after this match, he pulled a Metro Man, okay? They put him in the morgue because they all thought he was dead. His man just got pierced right through the heart. But he said, well, actually, my death was just a little exaggerated. And then he popped back up like the Undertaker inside the morgue, my dude. This man was already in the bed. I don't know why the bed was open, but Shion opened up the bed. So from this point on, he was just going around the entire stadium, just murking people left and right because after using Fallen Demon so much during this match with Kuroki, and he used it a little bit during this match with Ren, this is when Setsuna's mind started going crazy. He started getting all these visions of Nico. So he's now going around the entire stadium, murking people left and right, left and right, right and left. But as he's murking people left and right, what's important to note is that he still is himself because when he ran into both Xion, he ran into Xion Masada, he ran into Kazi, basically people who he actually did like, he didn't just kill them. He only killed the people who were hallucinations of Nico, and that's the only reason he was actually about to attack Kazi, because when he brought Kazi away, he only did it because he wanted Kazi to be safe from a preemptive attack from Tiger Nico, sorry, a preemptive attack from the cool Nico. Now, when he then brought Kazi alone, that's when his vision started kicking in, and he saw Kazi as the cool Nico. In other words, he saw Kazi as the devil. So, what would any person who follows his god see or do when he sees the devil? He is going to try to exterminate said devil so he doesn't take away his god. And that's when his god then reappears and saves the devil. And so, to hear to use mind, so many things don't make sense. Why is the person who's supposed to be so good in the world helping out this bad person? You got to see things from Kiryu's point of view in this way, because it makes so much sense when you think about it like him. But when you think about it like a rational human being who actually has their head screwed on tight, you know that Kiryu is actually just batshit crazy. And so during his fight with Oma, Kiryu explained everything to Oma and said, bro, why are you helping this man? This man is not a good person for you, my guy. And so that's when Oma's looking at us like, bro, what, what are you on? What are you talking about? And so he realized the only way to, to help Kiryu was essentially to kill him. Which, you know, because story reasons, he couldn't actually kill Kiryu. So we find out later on in Omega that Kiryu survived. Go figure. So let's go on to Omega. So in Omega, he's not taking part in the Purgatory Tournament, but he does take part in the story in a very interesting way. We see him during the Purgatory versus Kengen Tournament where he encounters Ryuki. Now, Ryuki, this is really interesting because Ryuki is a clone of the same person that Oma is a clone of. I should have said spoilers. So the Sasuna, he just found a build a Oma workshop. So what did he do? He tried to groom Ryuki into becoming his god. He wanted Ryuki to essentially replace Oma in his eyes. But in order for him to do that, he needed Ryuki to be, well, and have the same murderous intent that Oma did all those years ago. So that's when he started yapping into Ryuki's eyes, telling him, yeah, kill him, yeah, Beat up Adam. Yeah, I'm going to teach you Rockets just Palm too, my guy. Yeah, by the way, teach me a little bit about that Koei, about that Gao style. Okay, I got you with the Koei Rockets just Palm. You got me with that Gao style? All right, bet. And that's how their relationship actually acted. And so when Koga was out training with everyone else, then Ryuki had that little dichotomy where he was training with Setsuna. And training with Setsuna and by the way, Ryuki was also training with Setsuna and Okoya. This man was actually out here for blood. Having Ryuki train with two of the most unstable characters in the series was actually really genius because we all know Okoya is not stable at all, okay? Justice will prevail. But Kiryu, we already know, is just absolutely not stable at all. And we wanted him, or at least I wanted him to be somewhat stable, in the head at least, when everything came through. Because I ain't gonna lie, this man Kiryu was big balling. I forgot to mention, like, this man got all the money when he killed his father. Like, he is rolling in the dough. That's why he was able to roam around the academy doing absolutely nothing. So after trying to talk Ryuki into becoming this same godlike beast that Kiryu wanted Oma to be, 
That's when Ryuki was saved thanks to the plot. And then Kiryu said, all right, I'm done with this nonsense. And then he encounters the uncool Nico. This is where we get peak Setsuna content, my guy. This is peak Setsuna right here. See, if you look right here in Omega, he got the clean cut. He got himself together. He got the nicest face wash you've ever seen. And yet somehow he still manages to get duffed despite all the buffs he got. And when I say Duff, though, it wasn't actually a bad fight, okay? He actually pushed the, the uncool Nico to some severe limits. These were limits that William Wu actually said, bro, well, not William, Gilbert Wu said, bro, i never seen you get this serious before. What, what happened, bro? What, 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 is he really like that? And then the, the uh, uncool Nico said, yeah, this guy kind of like that. I remember when he was a little pup years ago. Man, let me tell you, I thought he was going to be strong. I ain't gonna lie, bro. I was right. Hey, give me some, bro. I, see, I told you, bro. I told you. I know how to pick a student, bro. Get me, bro. This is big, uncool Nico. This big tiger. So that's when we go into the second half of the fight. Now, during this fight, this is where we see the growth of Setsuna, where he starts using Rakish's palm, or rather, it feels like he's using Rakish's palm in a way where he takes a tablecloth and twists it against this like, very expensive bottle of wine and uses it as a weapon. It's a million dollar weapon at that point. This is a million dollar bottle of wine, or rather a million yen bottle of wine. And so while using this little piece of attack, it's just pissing off the tiger Nico because like, bro, like, why are you swinging this, man? It's like a million yen. You understand how long it took me to save this up. Like I said, Kitty was rolling them dough. To him, this is probably like a can of soda. This is when we're introduced to his tactics and different moves where he starts using the Gao style crouching dragon, sorry, earth dragon and the rockish soul together in order to create air rending. Now, this was a really cool spin because we know that Setsuna is very adept when it comes to Nico style and that the Gao style is very synonymous to the Nico style. And so it's really cool just seeing how he's just able to combine these two martial arts so easily. Speaking of easy, while William Wu was actually bodying Akoya, that's when Akoya then got up with some freaking dynamite, bro. Because mind you, Setsuna's on the ground. He is bleeding. He is on his last leg this man the uncool nico is about to go for the kill at this point then akoya busted in. then this man threw some dynamite on the ground blew up the building and dragged setna out saving his life but we don't exactly know what happened to akoya in fact we don't fully know the extent of what happened to batman this man listen the amount a realness in that moment for Akoya, where he shook off the shackle, he cast aside the body armor, and then grabbed Setsuna. He wasn't going to let someone who he deemed not evil to die like that. Let this sink in. Akoya did not see Setsuna as evil at that moment. I'll be damned. So at this point in the story, Setsuna's lying around in bed. He's just sitting around the hospital recovering after that fight with the Uncle Nico. So to wrap everything up, in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, Setsuna is definitely a character in the series who, I'm not going to lie, I like him. Not like that. I, he not second by Ashi level, but I do like him. He is very unique. He is very tricky. He is weird but in a sense that's actually tolerable he's not like that weird weird kind of weird he's more like a okay he's a pervert yes but he has a reason for being the way that he is so i'm not actually that mad at it so with that being said i kind of like setsuna no, I think he's uh, he's up there in terms of characters for me. But I want to know how you guys feel about it. So comment down below your thoughts on Cessna and who you'd like to see in the next video, even though you probably already know who it is because we're about to execute some justice. Thank you all for watching. You guys take care. Have a wonderful day. And I'll see you all for the next one. Y'all take care.